Good morning, um, everyone, to today's Boardroom Bites at 9. Our topic for this morning is director misconduct, and we have a panel discussion this morning, so very different um, setup versus our usual BB at 9 sessions. Part of the reason for the session's panel discussion is as a result of our recently released director misconduct paper, and um, the agenda for this morning will just include a very short welcome introduction by myself. Um, and then we'll have individual panelist presentations from our speakers this morning. And then we'll close out with a Q&A session at the end. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I just want to give you a little bit of a background around the guidance note that we released. We actually released, released um, this paper uh, about two years ago. Um, as a very high level attempt from an IDSA perspective to pull together all the information that related to director misconduct and how, um, whether it was employees, fellow directors or the public could handle um, or, or know where they should be able to report director misconduct because we get a lot of queries from our side on, on how to manage director misconduct. So this is where this guidance paper um, got um, a birth from. And we then thought it would be useful to actually collaborate with the CIPC, the company's tribunal, um, the DA, DTI, to get further input from all from these key stakeholders so that we had actually one consolidated document that gave very um, specific and correct advice to the public on how to handle the director misconduct. And our latest paper that we launched this year is a combination of our last year of meetings and consolidation and discussions with all these stakeholders and we've now finally landed up with what i believe is a really nice succinct document um, it's not going to give you all of the answers but it at least gives you guidance on how to di identify director misconduct um, it sets out a few of the mechanisms and strategies that you can look to, to deter director misconduct in your organization. It also gives you all the avenues that are available to address this and what are the consequences if somebody is actually found to be negligent or um, to have a mis uh, there being a misconduct. And then there's some practical guidance as well um, from the company's tribunal and the CIPC on the pro processes and procedures that they have and how to access the CIPC disqualified director register. Um, during my work with this project, I found um, a lot of the public and a lot of our members were not aware of how they can actually access the register. And I think it's very important for you to know how to do this because as, as part of your director due diligence process, when you're looking at nominations, you should be checking director IDs against this register to ensure that they're not actually listed. Um, so there's a detailed step-by-step -step guide on how you actually access this on the CIPC website. And there is a link on the a slide now to download. It is available on our website. It is free to, to, the, to the public. So you're welcome to share this uh, with your colleagues. And uh, we will put a link on the chat group as well so that you can um, access this as well immediately. So that's just a very high level overview. Our speakers this morning are gonna to touch on some of these things, these mechanisms and the avenues that are available and what you should consider. And I think we've got a fantastic panel that comes from um, different avenues and I'm going to bring you different perspectives. We've got Faye McAdam, who is a Chartered Non-Executive Director and one of our own IODSA's technical advisors. And Faye is also a, an advocate and, ha, and with her experience uh, of being an active director, she brings the practical exposure and guidance of what you should be considering in these circumstances. Then we have Daniel Pretorius, who's a partner at Bowman's. Daniel brings his um, knowledge and experience around the actual key legislation, as well as case law. And he will also go through some of the key elements that you should be considering when you're looking at potentially um, bringing a, a case for director misconduct. What do you need to prove and what are the sections you need to rely on? And then we've got a Sobrin Chetty, 
who is part of the CIPC. Um, Sogren is heavily involved in the enforcement and investigative unit at the CIPC, trying to ensure companies are actually complying with the Companies Act. And um, his department has actually taken on um, quite a few direct misconduct um, allegations as well that's been brought to them. And he's going to go through exactly what the CIPC is doing in this arena and how they can actually help um, you as members and the public. So. We will start off firstly with Faye. So Faye, I'm gonna hand over to you uh, for your session and I'll see everybody back again for the Q&A. Thanks so much, Vicky, and good morning to everybody. Um, I thought that what I would do, given um, that I'm on the panel with both Daniel and Asogren, and we're each going to be looking at this um, topic of director conduct and director misconduct from different perspectives, I thought what I would do is take a step back and look at it from a more holistic perspective um, with, with Daniel and Asogren drilling down into some of the details. So first off, um, Vicky, I don't know who's, who's controlling the slides, you or me? I am Faye, so I'll move it for you. Okay, thank you. So then we can go on to the first slide. Just in terms of, of director conduct, we spent a lot of time recently, given all the um, delinquency applications and governance implosions, talking about director misconduct. But I think what we should do is take a step back and talk about what some of the levers are that regulate and govern directors' conduct. And what I often liken it to is when you get behind the wheel of a car, you can only do so if you've gone through um, your, your um, license exam and then the driver's test. And what I find practically is that a lot of directors often don't realize what the rules of engagement actually are. What is the ecosystem, the legislative and regulatory ecosystem that governs their conduct and sets out very clearly what the expectations are of the directors. So just if you look at the slide, I've looked at whatever the legislative and regulatory framework is. Obviously, um, depending on the type of entity and the industry and sector um, that it, it plays a part in, you will have a different basket in terms of the legislation and the regulation. Of course, everybody knows the Companies Act, and um, I know that, that Daniel's going to touch a little bit on the Public Finance Management Act, but there's also Treasury circulars, and when it comes to the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, the Prudential Authority, you've got certain um, uh, instructions or, or regulations that are applicable to, to an entity. And so it's up to the director, the individual director, to make sure that they are au fait with the applicable legislation and regulatory framework. Obviously, we do look at common law, and this we unfortunately don't have a huge body of case law in this aspect, but there is common law that is very clear around what the duties are of a director and the standard against which you will be measured. Then we've got best practice governance protocols, and here, um, obviously, we rely on King 4. And whilst I have been challenged on many an occasion in the public sector, um, where many governing authorities um, and, and boards, governing bodies, say that King doesn't apply to them, that it's only a listed entity um, uh, protocol that is applicable to listed entities, that is not the case. So um, it's important that you fully appreciate what the precepts are that are um, reflected in King 4. And then, of course, important not to forget is the policies, procedures, systems and processes that are relevant to that company because in order for you to as a director to offer oversight you need to appreciate how the company operates what their internal um, guidelines are what the policy statements are and ensure that there is no deviation and should there be deviation that there must be a very good reason for it thanks vicky if we look just to to talk about and when i when i say take a step back for me I would encourage directors and aspirant directors and senior managers to rather than be driven by the avoidance of penalty and looking for the loophole in the law or the policy framework, to rather do what is right. And that talks to adopting as a leader a values-based approach. And this is captured very succinctly in, in King 4 where we talk about ethical and effective leadership 
when we, we look at our integrated reports, we talk about being an effective and ethical corporate citizen. And what that means then is that we are looking at a foundation that is based on, in the slide in front of you, ethical culture, good performance, effective control, and legitimacy. And those all talk to a values-based system. I won't spend too much time on this, obviously, I mean, because it's not a King 4 um, presentation. But Vicky, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that in terms of um, uh, fulfilling your role to be an effective and ethical leader, the values that underpin it, and it's certainly that we, we talk about the pillars of the, the governance house, are things like integrity, competence, responsibility, accountability, fairness, and transparency. And what is often missing with boards is that there isn't a discussion around how do you define this? What does it mean to be accountable? And how does that play out in terms of the policies and procedures that actually give guidance? Again, not guidance to the nth degree, because we shouldn't try and become um, we shouldn't try and overreach in terms of managing everything, it's impossible to do, but rather to appeal to people to make sure that they fully appreciate that they are busy with other people's money, that they are making decisions that will have far reaching consequences for all types of stakeholders. And so you do need to be measured, have due regard and be measured at a higher standard. Thank you, Vicky. Just some light relief in, in my presentation. Make sure everything is done ethically, within reason, of course. And I know for those directors, practicing directors who are on the um, discussion this morning will appreciate that there, there cannot be anybody who goes through a, a journey of being a director on several boards where you are not faced with these types of challenges and questions, where you have to often weigh what's profitable and what would be um, great as a capital injection on the balance sheet of a company, but might not quite be the ethical and moral thing to do. Um, it might not be illegal per se, but is it ethical? And those are the questions that directors are faced with. And obviously, if we were to consider the values base that I talked about and some of those um, uh, pillars in, in the previous slide, then you need to be able to comfortably and confidently push back and, and draw the line and not, of course, um, default to what is within reason, of course. Thanks, Vicky. In terms of how we are measured, again, you know, it's, it's not really a tough choice as to who to dismiss. Do we talk about incapability, brown or misconduct? Um, it's really around whether or not one can fix it where there is a defaulting director and whether one can be rehabilitated. And, and I know between Daniel Asogren and I, we talk about the spectrum of whether there is a misconduct and a, a misdemeanor, as it were, which is a, a smaller offense versus the other end of the spectrum where you are found to be grossly negligent and so can be found to be delinquent. And all of this is captured quite nicely in the, in the paper that Vicky talked about earlier. So I would really encourage you to, to read it and look at how you can apply it in your own settings. Thanks, Vicky. If we then just focus on directors' legal duties, um, I know Daniel's going to go through this in a lot more detail, but the Companies Act is quite clear, and ignorance of the law is certainly never going to be a defense because it is expected that you understand what the rules of engagement are and you understand what is expected of you. So again, I know that not everybody is enamored by, by reading legislation as us lawyers, so I would suggest that you, you pop into the Companies Act or, or the whatever other enabling legislation is pertinent and relevant to your um, entity and look at the specific and relevant clauses to begin with. And in this instance, you would look at the, the um, chapter on directors. What is important here, just on the slide, is also to be fully aware, and we've seen it coming up in recent judgments, where there is a seeming ignorance or unaware or, or, or unconsciousness or just people not wanting to accept the fact that directors and the board are jointly and severally liable. And what that means is that you are individually responsible and accountable and responsible and accountable as a collective as well. And that um, has a lot of implications when it comes to dissenting directors, when it comes to, to voting and how you, you might voice 
your, your displeasure or the fact that you don't agree with it and what you do in those instances. And even more important, what a lot of directors don't realize is when they're not present at a board meeting, it doesn't exclude them from the fact that they haven't been there or they haven't voted. As a board, you are measured as a collective and individually. Obviously, if there is a gross negligence or some intentional um, malfeasance, then there might be different degrees in terms of which you are found guilty um, if you weren't present or you didn't vote um, or withheld your vote. But by and large, the standard would be that the directors, the board as a collective is held as liable and as accountable as individuals as well. Thank you, Vicky. Just to talk a bit now about the merging between um, not just the, the legislation and director's duties, but also the common law duties. And we talk about um, fiduciary duties. That comes from the Latin term fides, which means faith. And it actually is um, likened to where, where a board is seen as the custodian of, of the focal point and the custodian of governance of a company and almost as if it is the decision maker and the mind of the company that actually makes decisions and gives guidance for and on behalf of the company. And that means that we have to be able to place our faith in the board, in the individual directors to make the right decisions for and on behalf of all stakeholders. So on the left of the slide in the orange block, you'll see the fiduciary duties. And these are just some of them. It's not an exhaustive list. Um, obviously not to use, use your position in any way that will harm the, the company, um, in any way that will benefit you personally to the detriment of the company, and to act in the best interests of the company. There's been a lot of debate recently about directors and boards acting in the best interests of the shareholder. But that is not the case. Factually, the directors are appointed, the board is appointed to act in the best interests of the company, and that is for and on behalf of all stakeholders. Again, practically, what would be a good idea is for you to do a stakeholder mapping, if mapping exercise as a board to actually identify who the stakeholders are of that company and what their different hot button issues or pressure points are, because that'll help you then in terms of deciding, especially where you have competing and conflicting interests and priorities. From a common law perspective, you've got your duty of care, your duty of skill, um, your duty of diligence. And the way these play out again practically is um, a diligent director is not a director who comes into the board meeting with their board pack still sealed in the brown envelope and then open it at that time. It's also not the director who asks a question that you know is answered on page 53 of the board pack. Again, it means that you haven't allocated due regard or due time to this very important position. Thank you, Vicky. There is a framework of authority. So as much as the board sits at the top and is responsible for decision making, from giving guidance um, and from, from monitoring and taking time as corrective action, what is important is that you don't act for your own interests. And if there is any interest or any conflict, that you not only declare it, but that there is a policy statement and practical guidelines as to what happens in the event that there is a conflict. And it is not simply about recusal, um, as seems to be the default position in most instances. So this, this little cartoon is really just to you know, talk about what, what happens in that you're not going to get away. You're not going to be um, sailing off into the sunset on a fabulous yacht if you are found to be wanting and if you are found to have crossed the line in terms of not fulfilling your duties. So it is incumbent upon you to be very clear before you put up your hand, before you accept a directorship, that you clear what your duties are and you also clear what is expected of you and how you will be measured and that that is consistently carried through as you acquit yourself of your fiduciary duties at every single board meeting throughout the year. Thank you, Vicky. Just again to remind you, and I know that Vicky's going to be sending you these slides, so it's really around um, capturing on one slide what the, the duties are. And maybe it might be a good idea, like having the Companies Act and, and the King Code with you at board meetings, is to measure every decision you make, every action you take against these duties. So you must act in good faith. You must have care for those who have entrusted you with this task. 
you obviously need a duty of skill. And this talks to, again, we can't deviate too much, but the um, nomination, selection, nomination, um, and appointment of directors, the vetting that goes through, do you actually have the correct skill or have you been selected because you are to be deployed to represent a shareholder? Um, all of those things are what give rise to conflict and for a board not to be acting in concert and to be acting as a cohesive unit. So also, you know, it's, it shouldn't be up to the company to ensure that you are upskilled. It is a responsibility that you should take upon yourself. If the company is offering it, well and good, but in the event that they are not, it doesn't let you off the hook. I've talked a bit about duty of diligence. Duty to act for proper purpose is important in terms of what the strategic objectives are of the company. And like I said before, it's not just acting in the best interest of the company, although that is the priority, but also to act in the interest of all stakeholders, not just the shareholder, who are a primary stakeholder, but all the stakeholders. Thank you, Vicky. When we talk about um, independent directors, and, and I know the IODSA um, does independence assessments, is to, to look at whether people really are independent. And it is not just a case of, I put my hand up and I say I'm independent. Am I sure that it's not, not just about being, not being a supplier or not being a client, but whether or not there are any relationships at play or any situation which might cause me to, um, apply my mind in a fettered manner where I am under undue influence. And so we need to, to think about how we apply our minds and that we are at arm's length when we apply our minds, certainly if we are independent non-executive directors. And I'll talk about that um, just now as well in more detail. Thank you, Vicky. Daniel's gonna talk quite a bit about the business judgment rule, so I won't go into too much detail, except to say, that the, the new Companies Act is, has certainly um, uh, been drafted in a way that takes into account a lot more of the, the reality of situations on the ground. So in this instance, we know, especially when you're a non-executive director or a non-executive independent director, that you're not being involved in the company's daily affairs, that you have to place reliance on certain of the lines of defense, and that would be either management or any of the assurance providers. That means, or it's encapsulated in the Companies Act in the Business Judgment Rule, um, which says that you can place reliance on, on these people who are actually um, involved in the day-to-day -day management of the business and know better what's happening than you are. But just bear in mind that the Business Judgment Rule is not a silver bullet for protection. It doesn't mean that, oh, because they said that this is the way it is, that you can just say, okay, um, I take what they say as gospel. And that's why when we go into a litigation space, um, Daniel, I'm sure you can chat more about this, is when we, when we in court, then we actually um, ask for minutes of the meeting to show whether or not um, whatever was presented has been challenged, interrogated, and, and actually detail, additional detail requested. So please don't see this as a silver bullet. Thank you, Vicky. This is really, for me, probably the most important slide here, is that um, directors are all created equal. There is no categorization of directors in the law or regulation. A director is a director is a director. Practically, though, we have different types of directors. Um, you have executive, non-executive, independent, etc. What's important for you to remember, whether you're a prescribed officer, an independent director, or an ex officio director, where you've been appointed simply because of your job, that you have a fiduciary role to play that is equal and consistent across the board. A non-executive director and an executive director are treated no differently in terms of expectations as a director. That is a separate relationship to the employment relationship and to the expectations we have of an executive from an employment perspective. So all directors are created equal, and it's important that you then appreciate that whatever the, the nomenclature or the descriptor is um, for you, if you're an exec, a non-executive independent director, doesn't mean that you will be measured any differently. Um, Vicky and the team know that the alternate directors are a personal bugbear of mine. I don't think that they are good practice at all. I, I have a lot to say about that, but I won't talk about it now. Thank you, Vicky. 
So when we talk about, and, and we are, you know, obviously the focus isn't just on director conduct, but on director misconduct and what that means and how that actually segues into delinquency applications, is that you need to be very clear about um, how you, you challenge whether or not a director has acted um, according to the five, his or her fiduciary duties or whether there has been misconduct um, or gross misconduct. And the reason that I put the slide in is just to um, caution people out there that it's you cannot bring um, some kind of allegation based on a, a whim or a you know perception. There does need to be evidence. There does need to be um, evidence that can be independently corroborated that the director as an individual or the board as a whole has not acted in the best interests of the company and hasn't fulfilled their fiduciary duties. And that means that it must be gross misconduct, that it must be gross negligence, because if it is anything that is just plain misconduct, then it is dealt with differently. And obviously, again, I'll leave it to Sogarin um, and Daniel to talk about what the, the um, different um, parts are in terms of consequence and implications that would fall from either. Thank you, Vicky. Some of the actions that would lead to liability, just to touch on it, and again, it is in the Companies Act, and we also pull it out in King and in the paper um, very nicely. Again, this talks to gross negligence, uh, gross misconduct, where you will not just be responsible, you'll be held accountable, and you will be held liable. And something that I am often amazed that seasoned directors, captains of industry don't appreciate, if you are found to be grossly negligent and if you are found to have not acted in the interests of the company, then you can be held personally liable. And that means that even if you have DNO, director and officers indemnification insurance, it will not necessarily cover you because you have acted intentionally with a view to, to malfeasance. So it's your car, your house, your family's well-being that is going to be targeted. So be very clear that um, before you make a decision or take a step. Of course, the, the slide in front of you of actions that lead to liability does talk to the intention behind it and the intention to defraud or the intention or that you knew something was happening, but you actually chose to keep it quiet. Thank you, Vicky. So I'm almost going to, in my final slide, just close the loop and say to all of you, whilst I love this and I would love to, to talk about the, the fear factor and say, please don't do this because you will get caught and, and your ROI is not necessarily your return on investment, but your risk of incarceration. But I almost want to, I do, not almost, I do want to appeal to all the, the attendees and, and people out there who are listening and people that we engage with. The minute that you take up this role, accept and embrace the responsibility, understand what it means, and then step up. I've been involved in a company for many years where we've actually, as a board, decided to forego DNO um, insurance because, well, A, that it's very expensive, but B, it's also about appreciating that the best insurance you can have as a director is to do your job, is to step up, make sure you equip yourself with whatever you need in terms of skills, knowledge, and information and do what you are required to do. Be present, be mindful, and rather than worrying about being caught out, do what is required for you to do in terms of being not just an individual, but a member of the collective and effective and ethical corporate citizen. Thank you, Vicky, that's me. Thank you, Faye, for that, I think, informative and a really good foundational um, setting for the rest of today's session. Daniel, I hand over to you. Thanks, Vicky, and thank you, Faye, for um, laying the groundwork here and providing uh, such detailed uh, background for us. Thanks very much. Um, I think, you know, when one talks about corporate governance, um, uh, there, there's been a great deal of publicity uh, in recent times. Uh, particularly around uh, delinquency actions. Uh, obviously, um, there have been some high profile cases involving uh, declarations of uh, delinquency. Uh, Vicky, we can move on to the, the next slide, please. Um, 
And um, that's, that's partly because uh, we've had these high profile cases, the Guwala case a few years ago, and, and quite recently, the um, Yeni case as well. Um, and so I think, uh, in a sense, that's been a distraction in the sense that there's been so much focus on, on delinquency proceedings that people tend to forget that the Companies Act provides a whole array of other statutory um, mechanisms by means of which directors can be held accountable and in certain, uh, certain circumstances also uh, liable. Uh, and so really um, in, in what is to follow, um, I will focus briefly on some of those statutory mechanisms. Um, I think it's also um, worth highlighting, and I think Faye touched on it as well, um, that in many senses, these um, statutory provisions uh, under which directors are held accountable or liable um, are ex post facto remedies. Um, there are provisions that are applied and, and, and procedures that are followed once things have gone wrong. Uh, and really, of course, then the corporate horse has bolted and there's been a failure of corporate governance. And in many senses, um, I think the objective should be to try to obviate that sort of situation arising uh, prevention, uh, needless to say, is, is better than cure. Um, and so fr from that perspective, I think it is very important um, that people who take up appointments as directors, um, that they are familiar with exactly what uh, their legal and corporate governance obligations are, what exact, exactly is um, expected of them. Uh, and that's why I think a paper such as the one that the Institute uh, is releasing now uh, is so very helpful, uh, particularly when it's read together, of course, with the King Code um, in the public sector, uh, where we have legislation such as the PFMA and the MFMA, we have the Treasury regulations. Uh, these also set out in some detail what's expected of directors in, uh, in public sector entities. Um, and so there too, it's incumbent uh, on board members to familiarize themselves with what is expected of them. Uh, in addition, um, in the corporate governance space, um, board committees such as the nominations committee and the corporate governance committee have important roles to play. Um, of course, the, the nominations committee uh, will engage with potential candidates uh, for board appointment and it's very important that they identify um, the appropriate people, people with the necessary skills, experience, um, but also people with the appropriate um, track record of, of ethical conduct uh, and, and people who um, apply and, and adhere to suitable corporate governance standards. Uh, and then once somebody has been appointed, of course, uh, the corporate governance committee has a leading role to play in ensuring that within a company, um, a, a, an ethical culture uh, and, and a culture of compliance, not only with the strict letter of the law, but also more broadly um, with the, the spirit of uh, corporate governance uh, requirements um, is adhered to. Um, the, so I have a list there of, of three or four um, uh, statutory mechanisms under the Companies Act to which one could probably add also section 165, which deals with derivative actions. It abolishes the, the old um, the common law derivative action, but creates a, a new statutory kind of derivative action, which in certain circumstances might be um, of relevance in, in this context too. So if we move on to section 69, then um, it sets out uh, in the circumstances in which somebody uh, will become ineligible or disqualified from serving as a director, uh, amongst other things uh, where they've been placed under probation. We'll get to that uh, when we talk about section 162 um, of the Companies Act. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, it sets out uh, for us in more detail the circumstances in which Section 69 provides for somebody to be disqualified um, as, as a director. Um, and really what one sees here is that, um, and I've tried to highlight that by, um, by underlining uh, some of the provisions here, is that the Companies Act actually sets a very high bar in terms of the degree of misconduct or malfeasance that will result in a disqualification. 
um, and sets um, a, a very high standard in terms of uh, when somebody will become disqualified, talking about dishonesty, theft, fraud, etc., and actually requiring a conviction in the criminal court uh, in many instances. Of course, it's not the only requirement, um, but it gives an indication of the fact that somebody really has to um, misbehave uh, very, very badly in order to be disqualified um, as a director. But the um, emphasis also there on, on trust, and we'll see that's a recurring theme um, as we talk about um, the circumstances in which directors can potentially uh, be held liable and when we talk about the standards of conduct um, that are expected and that concept of trust um, takes us back again to the uh, the concept of, of the Latin concept of fides that um, Faye referred to as well. The idea that somebody um, should not only be honest but that they should be um, trustworthy, reliable um, and, and, and faithful servants um, of the company. Moving on uh, to uh, the next uh, section, then section 71, um, this deals with uh, the circumstances in which a director can be removed from office um, and in broad terms creates two uh, mechanisms. On the one hand, uh, section 71.1 and 71.2 uh, deal with a situation where a director is removed from office by the shareholders and it then sets out a particular a procedure to be followed uh, in that regard and in particular uh, in accordance with notions of, of fairness and, and the old Audi Alter and Partem rule uh, where um, the board contemplates the possibility um, of removing, oh, sorry, the shareholders contemplate the possibility of removing um, a, a director from office. Uh, they need to give prior notification and afford that director an opportunity uh, to make submissions to the shareholders before they vote on that resolution. On the other hand, under uh, section 71, three and four, we have the situation where the board uh, may remove one of their fellow directors um, from office. Um, and what's important here is that uh, there would be a mechanism after such a removal from office for a director to take that decision on review uh, in the high court. So two, uh, distinct uh, and, and, and discrete uh, mechanisms, procedures. Um, they seem to be fairly clear and yet as the Steenkamp case has demonstrated, uh, there has been confusion in the past uh, about which procedure to follow and what the requirements are for removal in each instance. Um, so it's important um, that one be alive to the distinctions between the two um, procedures. Thank you, Vicky. Um, Faye has also touched on, on the business judgment principle. And to me, in a sense, uh, this is the point of departure. All of the other provisions um, that I'm dealing with, uh, in a sense, are uh, provisions that enable uh, one to take remedial action once, as I say, uh, some di director misconduct has occurred. Um, so many of those other provisions, in a sense, are, are negative provisions uh, to try to, to remediate a situation. Um, by contrast, seven, six, Section 76 sets out in positive terms what is expected um, of a company director. Um, and, and so, in a sense, it's, it's like um, biblical commandments, uh, thou shalt, you, and, and, and it's important to, to read the text um, of, of section 76.3 and 76.4, and in particular, the injunctive word must. Uh, there, there's an obligation on directors to act in accordance with the manner set out uh, in these provisions. Um, and, and so they are required, in particular, um, to take positive action to ensure that they are put themselves in a position where they can comply uh, with these requirements and with their other fiduciary um, obligations to, to the company. Um, so, so there's an obligation uh, on a director to take positive steps to do certain things. Um, it's not good enough for a director to adopt a passive supine approach where they omit to do what they are required to do. Uh, and importantly, um, th this was demonstrated quite clearly 
uh, in the recent High Court judgment in the Nyeni case, um, where a part of the court's ruling uh, that Nyeni uh, had to be declared delinquent uh, was based on her failure to familiarize herself with the relevant issues pertaining to the transactions uh, which she was found to have frustrated uh, to the detriment of the company. So, so there was a positive obligation uh, on her in the context of that delinquency application uh, to have acquainted herself uh, with the facts, with the commercial issues at play, with the relevant legal principles, and sitting back and failing to do that uh, was frowned upon by the court in no uncertain terms. Moving then uh, to section 77, um, here we speak more specifically um, about circumstances in which, um, and some of the circumstances at least, in which a director of a company can be held liable uh, and uh, a damages um, uh, order can be made uh, against the director. Um, section 77.2, um, provides in broad terms, I mean, it really uh, confirms common law uh, principles. Uh, so what, what seems to be happening here is that common law principles are being given statutory recognition. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we are dealing with a situation where a director has committed a breach of a fiduciary duty. And on the other hand, we are dealing with a situation where through the director's conduct, a delict, a, a wrongful act, um, has been committed. The important point here, of course, is that one is talking about um, losses sustained by the company. Um, so, so the um, award of damages would be intended to put the company in the position that it would have been, uh, and, and it's, it's for the protection of the company as a corporate entity. On the other hand, as we'll see on the, on the next slide, uh, in addition to uh, the, the common law uh, liability, uh, section 77.3 um, also provides for statutory liability in a range of, of circumstances. Again, uh, importantly, dealing with a situation where uh, the company as an entity um, has suffered loss um, as a result of uh, the conduct of a director. Uh, and, and there's a long list there um, of, of conduct that could give rise to such liability on the part um, of a director. Moving on to, um, to the next slide where uh, I, I refer to some cases that, that demonstrate some of these principles. I think, um, for example, the Flumisa case is, is an interesting one in the sense that um, it, it deals with a situation where a shareholder in a company um, sought to sue the company or the, di the directors um, because their conduct, so it was alleged, had resulted in a situation where the company suffered losses and as a consequence the share value um, declined. Um, and um, the High Court in, in Pretoria um, made a few uh, pertinent um, observations in that judgment um, and in particular uh, said that where, where a company has suffered loss um, as a result um, of the conduct of the directors, uh, and, and in particular where the directors have breached a duty owed to the company, it is only the company itself uh, that may sue in respect of the loss um, that has been suffered. A shareholder, the court said, could never recover the loss in share value as a result of a wrong done to the company. The only loss was through the company and in the diminution in the value of the net assets um, of the company. Um, and so the, the shareholders themselves were not uh, considered to have been affected uh, directly to the extent that they could hold um, the directors liable uh, under Section 77. Um, the Rabinovitz case, uh, on the other hand, um, in a sense, uh, takes us to the flip side of the coin, the converse sort of situation where a third party, um, not, not um, a shareholder, seeks to hold a director liable, uh, and that in, in particular uh, liability there can arise under Section 22 um, of, of the Companies Act. So where um, directors have acted in a reckless manner or in a grossly negligent manner or where they've acted for a fraudulent purpose, um, a third party could potentially uh, bring an application um, or an action uh, to sue the directors for damages.
Thanks, Vicky. Thank you very much. So finally, we then get to section 162, um, which is, uh, it introduces into our company law the concept of delinquency and also probation that's often forgotten about as well as another means um, of dealing with director uh, misconduct. Um, so under the old company's legislation, we didn't have uh, uh, provisions dealing with potential um, delinquency. Um, so the, the, the first question to be considered in circumstances where um, a possibility of delinquency arises is, well, who has standing to bring an application to a court to have a director declared delinquent? Um, and section 162.2 effectively um, provides that it's, it's got to be a stakeholder in the company um, who uh, brings that application. And so that issue came up uh, in the Mieni uh, case uh, where, of course, uh, the, the first applicant in that matter was OTA, the organization undoing tax abuse. Um, and one of the uh, preliminary objections raised by Mieni to the delinquency application was that OTA didn't have um, locus standi to bring that application because it wasn't um, a stakeholder in the company. It didn't matter in that uh, particular case because there was a second applicant uh, which was an association uh, representing the um, SAA pilots. Uh, and so because they were a registered trade union representing employees of the company, um, they had standing. And so uh, the court didn't really need to decide whether or not OTA um, had local standi. But um, it's important to bear in mind um, that as a general proposition, it's not open to a, a, a third party, uh, a member of the public, uh, to bring a delinquency application. If we then continue uh, and, and we look at the, the kind of conduct that could give rise to a, a court declaring a director uh, delinquent, um, again, uh, I've underlined the word must in, in, because it's important to realize that um, if it is established in judicial proceedings that a director has acted in a particular manner uh, that falls within the ambit um, of delinquent conduct, um, a court has no discretion. It is obliged then to declare uh, that person a delinquent director. Um, and um, we, we see here in section 162.5 sub A and sub B, um, situations where or two categories of delinquent uh, behavior uh, in particular where somebody acted as a director in circumstances where they were ineligible or disqualified or were under an order of probation and as we'll see um, delinquency falling within these two categories under subsections a and b uh, will have particular legal consequences we'll, we'll get to that in a moment uh, and we then see from subsection C onwards um, a range of other circumstances in which a director misconduct could uh, potentially give rise to um, a, de a declaration of delinquency. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment as well. So a whole long list um, of circumstances in which um, a, a director can potentially uh, be held to have uh, conducted themselves in a manner that was delinquent. Thanks, Vicky. Um, so, so here we see, um, in terms of the kinds of orders that a court can make, should it find a director to have been delinquent, uh, then, uh, as we saw earlier under subsections 5A and B, uh, the situation where somebody acted as a director when they were ineligible or disqualified or under an order of probation, um, that will result uh, in somebody being declared delinquent for the rest of their lives. Um, it, it's, it's sort of a, a life sentence almost, uh, whereas in other instances of delinquency as a general proposition, uh, the order of delinquency uh, will be in effect for a period of seven years. It would have been apparent from looking at the um, text of section 162 and the categories of delinquency um, referred to uh, that here too, uh, a fairly high uh, bar 
is set. Um, um, negligence on the part of the director typically uh, wouldn't suffice to give rise to a declaration of delinquency. Uh, as we see there from the, the Lewis Group case, uh, the court talks about very serious misconduct, not, not simply poor business uh, decision making. Uh, in any case, uh, we see again the emphasis on the importance of trust uh, in um, the corporate governance uh, sphere and, and in particular the idea that if a director should act in a manner that fundamentally breaches that trust, then that could potentially give rise to a declaration of um, delinquency. So if one looks at um, the case law, and, and over the last few years, a, a, a body of case law has begun to develop um, dealing with uh, delinquency matters. Uh, it, it will take a, a period of time, um, as Faye said earlier as well, you know, for um, a, a sufficient body of case law to develop for one to be able to extract clear principles um, as to how the courts will interpret and apply uh, the provisions of section 162. But I think if one looks at some of these examples already, um, a, a few categories um, of director misconduct uh, are beginning to crystallize as potentially giving rise to uh, delinquency orders. So if, for example, uh, in this list, if one looks at um, items one and four, uh, one sees examples, I think, of what might be termed administrative misconduct, a situation where the directors fail to ensure that the, the company keeps proper accounting records and timeliestly prepares and issues financial statements uh, and arranges its annual general meeting. Those are, of course, important because it's, it's, it's through the annual financial statements and through the annual general meeting um, that shareholders are able to um, um, scrutinize the conduct of the directors and whether or not uh, they have adequately acted in the best interest of the company to promote its commercial interests and so on. Um, and so if, if directors fail to comply with their obligations in relation to annual financial statements and uh, annual general meetings, they are effectively depriving um, shareholders of the opportunity uh, to assess their performance and to hold them to account. Um, then I think also crystallizing is a category um, of director misconduct uh, relating to situations where a director elevates his or her own personal interests over those um, of, of the company. Uh, and if we look at items um, two, for example, and five um, and, and seven, uh, those are all situations where a director uh, improperly um, abused information that they have available to them by virtue of holding office or where they, because they know of business opportunities arising for the company, uh, they then avail themselves improperly of the opportunity for themselves uh, to derive some financial benefit at the expense um, of, of the company. Um, and um, then finally, the, the, the ninth item there, again, uh, arising from, from the Mieni case, um, a situation where even if um, perhaps the director did not personally derive any financial benefit through their improper conduct, but they deprived the company improperly um, of the opportunity um, to uh, make commercial progress, that too um, could uh, uh, conceivably um, be an instance of delinquency. Um, again, if one looks at the case law here, one, one gets a clear sense um, of where the courts are setting the bar in terms of um, delinquency declarations. And, and it's a high bar. Um, as I said earlier, um, I, I hesitate to talk about mere negligence because um, it's, it's not to suggest that mere negligence is acceptable conduct, but a mere negligence um, or, or poor decision making will not give rise to a declaration of delinquency. And I think that's important to realize that too, because what we have seen um, on, on occasion um, are attempts by disgruntled directors or shareholders 
um, to use the mechanism of, of delinquency as a means of settling personal scores and so on. Um, and, and clearly that's not going to work in a situation where a, a, a proper case cannot be made out uh, for a declaration of delinquency. Somebody who wants to apply for an order of delinquency needs to come to court and provide evidence of serious misconduct of the nature uh, that we see referred to uh, in these slides. Finally, then, um, I'm not going to deal with this in any detail, um, but it's important, as I said earlier, to remember that in addition to um, potential delinquency declarations, um, there's also the, the lesser remedy um, of, of an order of probation. Uh, in both instances, they are intended um, to protect the investing uh, public uh, and, and shareholders in a company uh, from people who ought not to be holding office as um, directors of a company because through their conduct or their misconduct, they've demonstrated themselves not to be worthy of the trust that goes to the very heart um, of the relationship between a director uh, and the company on, on whose board they sit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Daniel, I just wonder whether they, I received, there is a question that's come up and maybe, and it's around probation. Um, and maybe you should want to answer that now since we were on this, uh, still on the slide. Um, but one of our attendees wants to find out what does it actually mean to apply to place somebody un, under probation? So I think, I think your slides do provide the information, but maybe you just want to just touch on that a little bit more. Yeah, so, so clearly if somebody, um, uh, may, maybe one should draw the contrast between delinquency uh, on the, in fact, one can go further um, and, and refer on the one hand to situations where somebody becomes ineligible uh, or disqualified from holding office as director. You then have a situation where somebody is declared delinquent uh, and finally you have a, a, an order of, of probation. So there's almost a, a continuum, a spectrum um, of, um, of declarations with probation being uh, potentially the, the least serious of those. Um, and as one can see on the slide there under section 162.9a, um, a court has the power to make an order of, uh, declaring somebody to be under probation subject to particular conditions. In other words, um, the director may be able to uh, continue uh, uh, acting but subject to particular conditions imposed by the court. Um, and so really, as, as the word probation uh, indicates, it's really an opportunity for the director to demonstrate that they deserve uh, the, the trust um, of, of shareholders and that they should be allowed um, to act um, as a director. Cool, thank you, Daniel. So Bryn, we'll hand over to you now. Okay, thank you, Vicky, and thank you to, to Faye and Daniel for setting the groundwork and very high bar for me to, to pass. Um, the CIPC, uh, as the regulator, we've been in existence for almost a decade now. Uh, can you just go to the first slide, uh, please? So, so we've been in uh, in place for about a decade now. And usually we are at the tail end when it comes to director misconduct in the sense that the relationship has broken down and the parties are effectively fighting over the poodle and who exactly gets to keep the poodle. Um, so the act has got a complaints procedure and in terms of section 168 of the Companies Act, a person may file a complaint in writing on prescribed form 135.1 uh, in which they allege that the person has acted in a manner that is inconsistent with the Companies Act or that the complainant's rights under this act or, or in terms of the company's MOI rules have been infringed. So what usually happens from a practical perspective, the matter comes in, it is then provided with a reference number uh, and the case is allocated to an investigator who, who has to determine within 30 business days of allocation if the complaint falls within the CIPC's jurisdiction. 
If the complaint does not fall within the jurisdiction, the complainant is then advised accordingly. And in this and in such circumstances, you know, we usually refer the matter or tell the complainant to approach the company's tribunal if there is a dispute that can be resolved uh, in terms of alternate dispute resolution, uh, or if the matter involves criminal um, criminal uh, practices to actually approach the South African Police Service to open up a criminal matter. Uh, then you get a situation that if the complaint does fall within the CIPC uh, jurisdiction, an inspector would need to be appointed by the commissioner uh, with a mandate to look into the matter further. Uh, the legislation provides that uh, a complaint can be initiated proactively by the CIPC. So for example, if we see in the uh, you know, in the media uh, that there is an issue, we can proactively initiate a matter uh, on the request of another regulatory body uh, or by the Minister of Trade and Industry. Uh, next slide, please, Vicky. So the CIPC's interaction with director misconduct has been quite wide ranging and has traversed administrative, civil and criminal action. Examples of administrative action has been the issuing of compliance notices. Um, some interesting cases that we've had have been, for example, the CEO of Telcom in 2014 reaching section 44 and 45 of the Companies Act. Uh, in that matter, um, the company had to recover the loan that was provided to the CFO in breach of Section 44 and 45. And uh, the CEO had to attend a corporate governance course, uh, which was quite groundbreaking because uh, it, uh, it certainly had not been done in the country before, where you send a CEO of a listed company to go and learn the basics of what it is to be a director. Uh, then we've had in 2017, the chairperson of South African Airways, Ms. Ayani, for bringing Section 76, when she misrepresented to the shareholder of South African Airways the true facts of resolution taken by the board. She was required to clarify this misrepresentation to her fellow board members and shareholder. I think the scary part of that particular compliance notice was that Ms. Mayeni was part of that board meeting and resolution. So how she managed to get it wrong, we are not quite sure. Uh, and then we've uh, we provided a compliance notice to Steinoff, which was also quite interesting uh, because it represented the first time in a compliance notice where we required the company to identify the individuals that were involved in the falsification of the accounting records they had to open up criminal cases against these individuals and institute um, and institute uh, civil recoveries against these individuals. Uh, we see that uh, this trend has been uh, has been duplicated in the recent uh, Tonga Tulip matter, when the where the forensic firm had actually recommended more or less the same uh, uh, the same outcomes for the company to undertake. Uh, in that particular matter. Uh, next slide, please, Vicky. So interaction with civil action um, has been with regards to delinquency orders that have been granted by the court. Uh, in the case of uh, CIPC versus Cresswell, Western Cape High Court declared the director delinquent for a period of seven years. And obviously, uh, you know, it's very interesting that the court had expanded upon the issue um, of gross of gross negligence, because here the director clearly allowed the company to carry on trading while knowing that the company was insolvent, and he had made withdrawals from the company's bank account in the middle of the night while visiting uh, Club Langabar on the west coast. Apparently, uh, he was entertaining clients, but we seriously doubt that, and the court agreed with us. And the nice thing about this case, I think we saved a lot of uh, potential passengers, because in this particular matter, the director wanted to set up an international airport uh, in, in the Cape area, 
except that where he was proposing to place the airport was within the Air Force's bombing range. Uh, so that must, uh, so that could have potentially been quite an interesting, you know, uh, you know take off landing experience uh, for potential passengers. Um, in the case of CIPC versus Zwana, and Daniel did touch on this one, the North Haucheng High Court declared the director of NEXA disqualified in the sense that there was a previous application in which he was removed from a board of, uh, uh, from a position of trust. And so he should not have been a director uh, from that period onwards, because in this particular matter, Mr. Zwane was not only a director of NEXA, but when he was removed from the board of trust, then went on to become the CFO of UNISA. And, uh, and as you may know, UNISA has got various, uh, various companies that form part of the UNISA group. And he should have actually uh, been appointed as a director uh, of those companies because the initial court application disqualifying him uh, uh, from being a director uh, should have prevented him from actually becoming a director. And then he was also declared uh, you know, delinquent on top of that because uh, he had accepted uh, he had uh, accepted director fees from Nexa without the permission from his employer, and and this conduct amounted to willful misconduct and breach of trust. Uh, next slide, please, Vicky. So examples of criminal action we've. Um, uh, we instituted a criminal case via the SAPS and NPA against Quantum Property Group Limited. Again, this was not doing the basics correct in the sense that the, the directors had not prepared annual financial statements, had not held the annual general meeting. Shareholder complained. Compliance notice was issued to the, to the director and the company. Uh, there was, there was non-compliance and so the CIPC took the decision of instituting criminal action. It represents the first criminal fine in terms of the Companies Act that we as regulator achieved. And we, had all, and we were also pursuing the director, but prior to the, to the hearing of the matter, the director was sequestrated. So the prosecution authority then decided to only focus on the company. Uh, next slide, please, Vicky. So in our decade worth of experience, we have noted certain early warning signs uh, that we've picked up. And you'll see across the presentation from, Vic, um, uh, from Faye to Daniel, uh, you'll see that certain early warning signs that come up uh, time and time again. And these would be the blatant disregard for the Companies Act. I mean, the act, says that one should not trade recklessly. One should prepare the annual financial statements, hold AGMs, not falsify your accounting records. But still these directors do these things. Uh, so this we see as blatant disregard of the act and what, is and what is legally required to be a director. Then you get a situation when they, where they are not doing the basics right in the sense of uh, you know, holding the AGMs, and running the company as it should be run along the proper lines. And you get a situation where they do not know what constitutes the basics of being a director, and of course not acting in the best interests of the company. Um, another point is where the quality of director appointed, and there the sub-theme of no proper vetting and a clear conflict of interest that comes up, where the director actually gets appointed by the company and it is known that uh, you know down the line there'll be a clear conflict of interest in appointing this in this in appointing this particular director. Uh, next slide, please, Vicky. So, in terms of potential solutions that the regulator has identified in preventing direct misconduct, we as regulators certainly believe that there should be regular testing of a direct understanding of the law and what is required of him or, or her. Uh, you know, there should be a proper vetting and due diligence, for example, 
you know, one should check the CIPC disqualified director register. You know, we often have, and, it, and it's such a basic thing where, where, where companies appoint somebody and don't actually realize that the director has been disqualified. And if they had just done a quick check with the CIP, they could have saved themselves a lot of time and hassle. Then you get a situation where fellow directors and shareholders need to be vigilant and take early action in dealing with director misconduct. And one should be asking these difficult questions. Uh, you know, you will see the trend in the boardroom where a particular director is slacking off, not paying attention, not paying attention to, to the board pack given and effectively wanting to do their own thing. And I think it's incumbent upon fellow directors to, uh, you know, to, to, take these, uh, to take these individuals to task in order to prevent, uh, you know, things uh, effectively getting out of hand uh, uh, down the line. Then, of course, we've got the ability to initiate a complaint with the relevant authority. And I think what's very important, and we've seen this in the Steinoff matter, is to have a built-in clawback provision in the contract between the company and the director, should the director be found guilty of misconduct. I think it's very important that if a director understands that they have skin in the game, so to speak, that you know, they, they, they tend to behave a lot differently versus if they if know that there are no consequences. Um, yeah, and I think that, uh, that concludes from the regulator side, Vicky. Thank you, um, Ms. Sorgan. So I had a, took a while for my video to come on again. I think Daniel can also put his video back on now. And we'll move into our Q&A session. We actually have got quite a few questions that have been um, popping through throughout the session and we'll try our best to answer as many as we can for the remaining um, part of the session. Um, so let me start going um, with, with the first one that was raised and I'll, I'll try and see if I can uh, lump some of the questions up for the speakers just to make it a bit easy to answer. But the first one that we received um, from Deepak is how does our duties of directors or as directors in terms of our Companies Act compare to the rest of the world? Um, the reason for the question is that there are many directors who sit on multiple boards in multiple jurisdictions. Thus, they need to always ensure that they are aware of their legal as well as common law duties and responsibilities. And linked to that was another question uh, by Patrick around our directors of subsidiaries of South African companies domiciled in other countries or, or jurisdictions still subject to South African legal and corporate governance requirements. So I think those two questions link together with each other. Um, so between Faye and Daniel, I'm not sure who would maybe would like to answer that or both of you might have some comments around it. Um, well, uh, perhaps Faye, if I may, I'll, I'll start. Uh, I'm sure you'll uh, be able to supplement my answer with your insights. Certainly, as far as the first part of the question is concerned, um, one will find that uh, internationally uh, there's a great deal of overlap and similarity in terms of uh, principles of corporate governance and the, the duties of directors. Um, particularly uh, in, in, in very broad terms, uh, one can distinguish between two types of legal systems. Uh, on the one hand, there's what we call the common law legal systems, and those are largely the legal systems that in one way or another um, have developed from the English legal system. So most of the countries that at some point uh, were colonies or part of the British Empire uh, adopted legal systems uh, that were closely related to uh, English law and in particular um, adopted uh, principles of English company law. So certainly in South Africa, uh, for example, the uh, 1926 uh, Companies Act um, very closely mir mirrored uh, the English Companies Act and imported into South African law uh, many of the principles of, of English company law. Uh, and one still sees that uh, even in, in the present 
uh, Companies Act that there, there's a great deal of similarity between the basic principles uh, of company law here uh, and, and in England, uh, and there's that similarity uh, likewise with the legal systems and in particular the company law uh, of many other uh, countries uh, that, that adopted that English system. On the other hand, uh, there's what's known as the civil law system uh, based principally uh, on European continental legal systems. Um, their systems of company law historically uh, were, were somewhat different from those in the English and common law systems. But uh, in, in the last few decades, I think there's been a convergence uh, internationally, um, part, I suppose, of a broader process of globalization uh, in terms of which the, um, there's an increasing similarity, as an increasing commonality uh, in terms of principles of corporate governance applicable um, across the board. So if somebody uh, were to be a director um, of companies in, in various jurisdictions, um, of course, they will in each jurisdiction um, have an obligation to acquaint themselves um, with the uh, salient principles of company law and with corporate governance principles in each one of those jurisdictions, but they will find uh, that they, they, they're not in unfamiliar territory. Uh, principles are, are very similar, um, but as always, of course, the devil's in the detail, um, and, and that's where um, it's incumbent on directors if they take up appointments in different jurisdictions to familiarize themselves with, with the detail because there may be uh, different uh, requirements in, um, in different jurisdictions. But uh, as a general uh, proposition and speaking at the highest level of generality, um, the, the similarities will be far more pronounced uh, than, than the differences. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Thanks, Vicky. Yeah, Daniel's, Daniel's um, done an excellent job. So, um, you know, I don't have much to add, um, except to say that the, the, when we talk about the fiduciary duties, um, you'll find that there is, especially now in 2020, a commonality across jurisdictions, irrespective in terms of the, the broadest, and as Daniel says, the general view on what is expected of directors and the level or standard of conduct that is expected. But um, yeah, Daniel covered it very well. I think your second question had to do with if you, I think if this, the subsidiary was in South Africa. Yeah. Well, yeah, in that instance, I mean, you, you need to acquaint yourself with the, the uh, corporate legal and corporate governance um, regime of the jurisdiction of where the company is domiciled, which simply means that if the company is registered in South Africa or in South, one of the countries in South America, the board on which you sit, you need to acquaint yourselves with the, the legislative and regulatory regime where that company is domiciled. So that's easy enough. Again, you know, it's just, just before we, we go, you know, based on what Daniel said and my inputs, the, the thing again, I, I'm flummoxed by is when a, when a board member starts off, they don't seem to read. They, they, they don't read. So they don't always understand what the terms of engagement are. And if I look at all the presentations that Asoga and Daniel and I have done, is we've got a fabulous framework here and internationally. The, the guidelines are there, the, the consequences are very clearly reflected, but people are often just unaware because they don't take the time to read. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so we've got a few questions around dissenting directors. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pose the three questions that I've got here. The one is specifically to you, um, Faye. How does a director assume personal liability when they have registered dissent on a matter? And a follow to that is, may the panel please touch on the dissenting director in public ent entities specifically. So this is extremely difficult as majority of decisions tend to somehow uh, be disregarding or disregard the dissenting views and the dissenting director may end up being jointly and severably sued for the majority decision. And I think similar to that was the last question was, if you are recused, can you be held liable for remaining um, on the director you know, decision. So I, I think those are three 
kind of related and important questions as well as a, dissent, a dissenting director if you you know recuse yourself from a decision because or, or you vote against a, de a decision um you know i guess you know how should you tackle that and and ensure that you're not then jointly and separately liable with the rest of the majority i think um thanks for that vicky um again in one of the areas that seems to be um, uh, quite largely misunderstood, a dissenting director is a director who either doesn't agree with or votes against a resolution that is being tabled. And certainly, I don't know if we've got a paper on it, but we do have a slide in one of our programs that takes people through this in, in a fairly good detail so that you understand what the, the process is to follow, because there is quite a, a clear process. The first thing to do or to understand is that if you don't agree with something that is being discussed or the perspective that is being put on the table or the decision that is about to be made, the resolution passed, then you, it is incumbent upon you in terms of fulfilling your fiduciary duty that you put your, pair, your hand up and you ask for your dissent to be noted. Now, what's really important at this stage is to appreciate that if you are going to open the door of dissent, then you need to be quite committed to walking all the way through. So we're not talking about dissenting around um, changing logos and changing carpet colors. We're talking about dissenting or disagreeing or voicing some kind of alternative view um, on something that is critical to the company's sustainability, to its strategic direction, something that will have a consequence um, and an impact on, on its, its shareholders or its stakeholders within its ecosystem. So it must be something fairly serious. Once you have noted your dissent, you have very many options as always is that you've noted your dissent and that can be the end of it. And as in any democracy, majority rules. And so you move on in terms of going with whatever the broader view is of the board. What's important to know at this stage is that once the board has passed a resolution, that resolution binds the entire board, whether you've dissented or not, whether you are present or not. And that is where you start to see the collective liability and responsibility coming in. So if you have dissented, but the, the, the um, resolution still carries, you are bound by it. If then you still feel that you, it is such a dire situation and something that you are not settled with in your own heart as being in the best interests of the company, then after you have noted your dissent, if the board or the chairperson still feels that they want to pass a resolution and you want to stop that, you can at that point request that you have an opportunity to prepare a paper, that you have an opportunity to engage the board further, engage the task team, individual board members or the chairperson to try and convince them that the decision that they're making is not in the best interests of the entity or its stakeholders. Now, of course, to remember here again is that if it was this serious to begin with, and if you had prepared and read your board pack, then prior to the board meeting, you would have already raised these issues and, and requested from the chair that you get an opportunity to table your concerns. But if you haven't done that, then you still have an opportunity thereafter to do it. Depending on the, the nature of the, the decision that is required, depending on whether or not it's time sensitive, um, the chairperson might allow for an additional delay, but if it is time sensitive, maybe it's a 24, 48 hour time period that you're given. And then you have the opportunity to do some lobbying, to do some round robining, and to explain to the board why you feel that they have not taken all the factors into consideration and why the decision that they're going to make is wrong. Once all this has been done and it's called for a vote, and this is obviously assuming the chair does give you the time of day in this regard, then um, the, a vote is going to be taken. And at that point, you can again choose whether you now are going to be bound by the majority decision or whether you are going to, to respond differently. If you still feel that the decision that is going to be taken is incorrect, then you have an option. If you stay, you will be considered to have been party to that decision. If you feel that it is so wrong, you have the option to resign. Now, that's all well and good, and we can talk, uh, just park that for a second. 
if we look at the, the personal and or individual and collective responsibility and liability, you need to understand that all directors are created equal, that the board decisions are those of an individual and a collective. So if you open that door that I was talking about, and if it is something so serious, then going through and walking through the door means you have to take all those steps. And ultimately, if you do not want to be held liable or accountable, or you feel so strongly that the incorrect decision was taken, then you must either resign or subject to not breaching any duties of confidentiality right to the shareholders. Um, and if it is something serious, then alert SIPSI and alert other, other um, authorities where, where applicable. The issue that we find mostly with dissenting directors is that directors feel that if they, they pick up their hand and say, I dissent and I want my dissent noted, that that's the end of it. When it comes to, to liability, if it is found that the decision was wrong and if there was an adverse impact, then yes, if you have noted your dissent and if you've said that you want to um, abstain from voting, etc., then certainly the liability would be reduced. But that doesn't mean that you will be off the hook completely, not at all. And so people need to stop thinking that the minute that they dissent, that there is some kind of protection. It simply means that if there's a consequence or a, a claim and liability to ensue, that maybe your fault will be diminished. And so the claim against you might be reduced in terms of, of against the other members of the board. But quite frankly, the only way to protect yourself completely is to do what you can to stop the decision from being made, or ultimately you will have to resign and then bring it to the attention of the authorities. The second point, um, just before I open to Daniel and Asogarin, but is also around the, the public entities issue. There is a, a misunderstanding and a mis um, Noma that the when you are, are appointed to a board or a governing authority, executive accounting authority, either in the public sector or the private sector, that somehow things are different. If you are a director or in a, uh, a position of, of uh, leadership and where you are responsible for the decisions being made, then the same would apply in terms of the governance protocols and the applicable legislation, whether it be the Companies Act, PFMA, et cetera. And if you read all this legislation, the, the duties and standards of the directors or the leadership are very similar. So the fact that you might have been deployed as a shareholder representative on either a public or a private sector governing body certainly doesn't um, allow you to abdicate any responsibility in terms of um, uh, your fiduciary duties or what you need to do in terms of dissent. You also need to appreciate and have a conversation with the shareholder who deployed you that it might be um, you came on a train and somebody else bought you a ticket, somebody else packed your lunch, etc. But once you reach your destination, that you are there to act in the best interest of the company or the entity and all its stakeholders. And you need to have that conversation with whoever deployed you because you are not acting in their best interest. You are acting in in theirs and everyone else's best interests at all times. So if you find that you are in conflict with whoever your principal might be in terms of the decision that might be made, then you've got to deal with it because whoever asked the question is very clear and, and or is very correct in saying that you will be the one who is held liable as a director, not your principal. Thank you, Vicky. Vicky, if I may come in, I think that's a very comprehensive and if I may say so eloquent uh, response. Uh, so I have very little to add other than to say that, um, of, of course, in a situation where a board has adopted a resolution or decided on a particular course of action, uh, which is unlawful or not in the best interest of the company or causes the company to suffer loss, um, the, the liability of the directors wouldn't arise merely from the adoption by the board of that uh, resolution. There, there would have to be uh, a further step in the sense that there would have to be legal proceedings that will declare the directors liable and, and impose on them liability in a particular amount. In other words, a requirement that they 
um, pay damages. Um, so um, th there will have to be evidence before a court um, of the nature of the decision, the circumstances in which the decision uh, was taken, um, and the discussions that occurred at board level uh, before the decision um, was taken. And a court then uh, will have to decide based on all of that evidence, A, whether or not uh, to hold the board members liable, and B, if so, uh, the quantum of such liability. Uh, and it might well be, depending uh, on the evidence before the court, uh, that a court might say, well, here we have a board of five directors, um, one voiced a very strong dissent and fought tooth and nail um, against the decision, but ultimately was outvoted. And a court might well say, well, I'm not going to hold that director uh, liable, but that would require a, a, a very clear and strong uh, conduct on the part of that director, not, not simply uh, passively uh, dissociating themselves from a particular decision or abstaining from voting, uh, you know, so a half-hearted dissent uh, won't, won't suffice. Uh, you know, the, the director, in order to avoid liability, would have to take all possible steps within their power to dissuade the other board members from adopting a particular um, course of action. Um, so it wouldn't be good enough simply to say, oh, well, I disagree um, and I, I can't go along with this um, and then to abstain from voting um, or, or to, to walk away. Uh, as, as Faye has explained in, in some detail, uh, the director would need to take every reasonable step uh, to try to um, bring the errant fellow directors to better insights. Um, and, and a court will certainly, I think, take that into account uh, in deciding whether or not to impose liability, uh, and if so, um, in what amount. Thanks, Daniel. Or Sogren, is anything you would like to add? I think, you know, it's quite interesting on what both Daniel and Faye say. I think, you know, it's so important that a director, when they choose to become a director, fully understand what they're getting themselves into. And I think it's also important, I mean, you know, these these little, you know, issues, you know, they effectively snowball over a period of time. And, I, and, and, you know, we see as regulator on a daily basis where a lot of the people that we engage with say, you know what, if they had known upfront, you know, what it would mean to be a director, an effective director, a lot of them would not have accepted that position in the first place. Uh, so I think, you know, it's a matter of, you know, that if you want to be a director, you need to go into it with your eyes wide open and understand the consequences of, uh, you know, of, of being in that position. Uh, Vicky, thank you. I agree. Thanks, uh, Sogan, for putting that so, I think, clearly. Just to answer Faye's question on whether there is a guidance paper on dissenting directors, there is one, so we do have one on our website. Um, it was published through our corporate governance network a few years ago. We actually are in the process of just reviewing and seeing if that needs to be updated, but the content of that paper is still quite valid. Um, so, can, while I'm on oh, you, you, there are a few questions around the CIPC and as a regulator. So I'm gonna pose one or two questions to you since, since I've got you on the floor. Um, the one was around um, the compliance decisions that you mentioned. Are these publicly available on the website? Can people actually see the, the notices that have gone out or, or um, is this kept private? And uh, following that is a question around whether the CIPC is satisfied that they've got enough power to act on directors who fail to comply with these compliance notices. So, so what happens if somebody doesn't comply with the notice? Okay, so in terms of the compliance notice, I guess it's akin to a, um, a private censure between regulator and the company. Except, of course, you know, if, uh, if the press gets wind of, uh, of a particular matter and uh, or, if, uh, or if we direct the company, for example, to release via the JST sense, uh, you know. So, so the compliance notice for the majority of the time, you know, is, is, is a matter between the regulator and the company and, uh, and for 
and for the company and the director to obviously comply with that. Uh, you know, it usually gets out where it involves a high profile individual and that's usually uh, the financial press making inquiries and that's how the content of those compliance notices uh, do get out. Um, on the second question of whether the compliance notice is effective, I think uh, I've demonstrated in the slides uh, that, uh, that we are quite serious about uh, about non-compliance with the compliance notices. We do have the option of both criminal uh, as well as civil, uh, uh, you know, civil remedies and actually pursued both. Uh, I've just used these examples, but there have been a number of other examples where uh, there have been, um, there have been, you know, either criminal or civil action that has been, uh, you know, that's in the process of being taken. So I think, uh, I think we've got a fairly good handle on it. I mean, obviously over time, you know, we'd obviously like to make it uh, more streamlined, but I think for now we are quite happy with the way it's sitting. Uh, Vicky? Thank you, Sergan. Um, I'm just gonna follow a few questions um, for you. I've got about four more that is specifically around the CIPC. Um, the first is, um, this was by an anonymous, um, having regard to expense, the expensive nature of litigation, does the CIPC have, have an oversight mechanism to act on alleged allegations of director misconduct on public domain um, and investigate? And I, I think you've kind of answered this already, Sogan, and you've shown that the CIPC um, does take on cases um, against um, directors. But my understanding, so maybe you can just maybe clarify that is, if somebody actually needs to submit a complaint or an, or an allegation to the CIPC before you will, will act? Sorry, Vicky, you broke up here a second. Sorry. Um, so let me repeat the question. I'm not sure if you've gotten all of all of it. Um, so there's a question around whether the CIPC has a mechanism to act on alleged allegations of uh, director misconduct that might be in the public domain. Um, so I think you've shown us already that the CIPC does have the ability to take on cases um, on it in its own right. But does somebody actually have to lay a complaint to the CIPC, an actual allegation, in order for you to investigate, or, or can you investigate based on information that you might come across that is in the public domain? Okay, so ideally we, do, you know, we would prefer for somebody to lay a complaint, but the Act does provide for us as regulator on a proactive basis to investigate. So, and we've done so in, for example, the Steinoff matter, you know, where, uh, you know, where the press had reported that there's been this fallout. We'd also taken action, for example, in the state capture matches, where we lodged criminal cases against McKinsey, KPMG, and SAP, for example. And that was based on a proactive initiative from our side. Uh, we do have a surveillance function in terms of Section 1872B of the Act that empowers the regulator to monitor proper compliance with the Act which is very broad. Uh, and of course, you know, it allows us to, um, you know, to make these inquiries to the company. Uh, and then if we feel that there is sufficient uh, background information, then approach the commissioner to, to, uh, to mandate a particular inspector to go forward and do an investigation. Uh, Vicky? Thank you, Sergeant. I just I've I've left my video off just um, as I saw that we had a bit of connectivity issue, so I'm going to leave mine off, and you'll just hear my voice. If anyone was wondering why you can no longer see me, um, from a, a company. So the next question was actually, uh, Sergeant, can someone lay an anonymous allegation to you? Yes, they can. But you know, eventually, you know, if if you start to, uh, you know sort of delve in, you know, into the matter. It becomes very difficult, uh, you know, to actually pursue this because I guess the respondent would want to know, listen, what is the purpose, uh, you know, of the investigation? Um, so ideally we'd like, you know, we'd like there to be a person behind the complaint rather than simply there being an anonymous complaint. And I think the other problem is, you know, it, it, it prevents a situation 
for people to abuse the the system in terms of you know trying to settle scores that they may have that the regulators obviously aren't aware of. So I think the short answer is yes, we'd actually prefer to have somebody behind the complaint rather than an anonymous complaint. Uh, Vicky? Great, thanks, Mr. Sobrin. Um, then, then one last one. Well, there's, it was, there's actually two. The one is where do you access the Director Delinquency Register? And I think I can probably answer that one to say if they do look at the um, link and look at our, our guidance paper that we've listed, we, we set out clear guidelines there on where you can access it. It is on the CIPC website. Um, if you look for, um, you've, you've, got to, you've got to sign in as, as a customer and create a login details. And once you log in, you will see a button there for the, the list. So that's, uh, that is, I think, quite easily accessible once you've got a customer login detail. And then the, the last thing a slogan was around, um, what are the options for state-owned entities um, or directors that, that, that sit on, on state-owned companies that may not be subject to the Companies Act? And, you know, can they, you know, is there any recourse that they can have with the CIPC? Again, it depends on, you know, jurisdiction and I guess on a case by case basis. I mean, look, the door is always open for those directors to approach us as regulator and explain their particular problem and concerns. And if we as regulator are not able to assist them because of jurisdiction and mandate, we can always point them in the right direction. Uh, Fantastic. Thank you so much for answering those questions, Osogan. I think um, definitely questions that I think a lot of even just the general public may have also been thinking as well that we might have answered now. Um, I see Daniel and Faye also put off their, their videos. Um, you, don't, you, don't, you can put them back on again. I've just kept mine off uh, just for ease. So we, we don't have a lot of time left, but um, there's some really good questions here. And I'm, I'm gonna pick this one because I, I think um, this is a nice spin to, to actually talk about. So uh, one of our members, Charles, has said we, we focused. We have focused on the breach of director duties to the company um, and conduct and their conduct in carrying out their duties to the company. But can we speak a bit on director conduct outside of the boardroom? So where they breach you know, moral clauses. I, I think we've seen quite a few things as well where uh, directors do or say things on social media, which is outside of the boardroom and they've held accountable for it. So but, uh, I don't know, Daniel and Faye, is there anything that we can maybe put a few comments or talk about that, you know, sure. actions um, outside of the boardroom? Sure. Um, Vicky, the, the first thing to just note, and again, it, it is a comment that all three of us made, is at the outset when a, a director is appointed, um, you probably will have a board charter or some kind of, of documentation that guides you, but there, there would highly likely be a code of conduct or some of these aspects would be included in the board charter. And what is a, a good idea is not just to, to hand these things out at an induction, well, first of all, have an induction, but not just to hand these things out and hope for the best, but get the directors to sign off to say that they have read understood and agree to be bound by um, the, the contents of those documents, because that gives you some kind of foundation in terms of a, a contractual relationship. Um, I'm being a typical lawyer now, Daniel, of, of how we can litigate in the future. But be that as it may, most of these, these codes of conduct um, include a clause that says that you shouldn't bring the company into disrepute. And so, of course, it does depend on the nature of the company. You're going to um, look at a company like Google, for example, very differently to the way you will look at um, church incorporated or some kind of religious institution. And so the, the type of disrepute we're talking about and what goes against the, the values and ethics and morals of that institution would be um, directly related to the type of institution they are. It does also talk about company culture and what is allowed and what isn't allowed. So you'll see some companies, even though they might be in the, um, I know the financial services space, um, there's one asset manager that runs a very relaxed ship. 
Um, there's no suits and ties or anything like that. And everybody's, you know, there's no hierarchy. Everyone's very relaxed. So there, I would think that the, the code of conduct would be differently applied to if you may be in another financial sector services entity where um, it's very hierarchical, very rigid in terms of the culture. So what that talks to is, is also lead us to being aware that now that we are in a um, living in a digital time, that you might think that you are having a private function or saying something privately. But if it is recorded and it can go viral, then it might have the impact or consequence of bringing, bringing the company into a disrepute. And then that falls or goes against your duty of care and your duty of diligence and the standard by which you are expected to uphold the company's um, profile. So I think it's important that these conversations are had up front once you, you have your induction. Um, just as an example, I had a, a client where the, the CEO, again, was he had quite a good relationship with all his people. Um, and uh, he had posted a, a photo of himself online on Facebook when he was on holiday and wrapped in a sarong and bare chested. And because a lot of the, his, his staff were, had friended him on Facebook, um, the company sought to take him to task as an employee in terms of bringing the company into disrepute. And because he had befriended the employees on, the, on Facebook and it wasn't just seen as a private space, um, they believed that he should have taken more care and um, not posted. Um, photos that um, a lot of the, the board members felt was inappropriate. So, you know, it's, it, it, it is a difficult consideration, but you have to, we, 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 we actually have so much material at the moment where leaders who are in certain positions say things that they maybe shouldn't say or that they should be allowed to say. And I think you just need to be mindful that the minute you're appointed to a position of leadership, or anything that is in the public domain, that you do give up an element of privacy and you do have to be very mindful of what you say, what you do, and certainly what you post. Thanks, Faye. Daniel, anything to add to that? Yeah, just very briefly. I mean, what one often sees in a situation like this is somebody will uh, defend themselves by saying, oh, but I was acting in my personal capacity. I wasn't acting in my official capacity. And I think increasingly, that's an artificial dichotomy. Um, you know, once one holds an office, um, the, you, you, your, your scope for acting in your personal or private capacity uh, uh, diminishes, I think. Uh, that on the one hand. On, on the other hand, um, obviously the, the grounds on which um, either the, the shareholders or the board may remove a director from office are circumscribed. Uh, either by the legislation on the one hand or um, by the contract of appointment on the other hand. And so I think it is very important, and, and, and Faye uh, touched on this at the outset, um, that uh, contracts of appointment and codes of conduct should be very clear um, about what is expected of directors and um, in what circumstances uh, their conduct that might be perceived to be in the private sphere might nevertheless um, have consequences in the corporate sphere. Thanks, Daniel. Um, another question that's been asked a few times is, can shareholders be held accountable for appointing di a director without ensuring the director has the adequate skills to perform the role? Um, and or can, can shareholders be held liable in cases of director misconduct with, with the board appointments? are made contrary to prior advice recommendations. And, and I guess, Faye, um, for me, what kind of ensues from these two questions is the importance around background checks and searches and doing proper due diligence before you actually make uh, decisions to appoint someone on the board. And somebody did actually ask this question of whether or not we support that. And, and I think the, there's a very clear answer there of yes. Um, that should be part and parcel of any nomination and appointment process. Um, someone else has also asked, you know, if there's a judgment on a director, are they allowed to be a director? And I, I think, you know, Daniel did cover this as well. And, and the simple answer is no, the Companies Act does specifically say that a company cannot knowingly appoint someone that is ineligible or disqualified. 
Um, so again, those background checks and the due diligence forms an important part of the process because as part of that background checks is you checking on the number of directorships a director holds, where else do they actually have these directorships? You know, are there conflicts of interest? Do they have, you do a criminal check, et cetera. So that's all part and parcel, I think, of, of that background um, search. So to come back to the actual, those two questions, um, Faye, Daniel, or Sobren, I'm not sure even if you can answer, are around shareholder liability. So I think um, just before I answer the question, the one thing that um, companies seem to forego or maybe not be as, as robust and rigorous about is they collate all this information from directors and pay lip service to some of these processes, but then don't follow up or do anything with it. So if I was, um, you know, we, we should be very clear, first of all, if we're advertising or if we are recruiting for directors as to what we expect in terms of the, the qualifications, the skills base, et cetera, experience. Once we get those people on board and they've been interviewed and gone through some kind of rigorous assessment um, or interviewing uh, process, then we, we absolutely must um, run these checks and it also depends on the type of company you are being appointed to so for example when I was appointed to um, the stock exchange you you have to go through a very deep rigorous assessment from by the financial sector conduct authority as well um, so there, there are different layers so the depth of the vetting depends on on the type of position the type of entity that you're going to be appointed to but at very um, least it, you do need to to do a credit check, a criminal check, etc. I think at the at the very least, um, if you find something, then you need to take it to the chair, and the chair needs to to engage the board, and you need to make a decision. Obviously, if the something that you find, um, uh, you know, just uh, or excludes the person because of the law, then so be it. The law is the law. But if you find that it is something, and I know we had a matter once where. Um, one of the um, uh, board members who had, well, one of the, the interview candidates um, who was going to be appointed and in the, the, the checking found that he had a, a, was blacklisted years ago because of some, one of these, these mainstream retail stores and account that hadn't been paid and it, it, when he was a student, for example. So the discussion was how long, you, for, you know, because the systems might not be um, up to date, how long do you allow these things to, to hold over? And is a 60 rand outstanding fine to, to Edgar's, for example, um, sufficient to preclude him from being appointed? So there are those discussions. So I don't think it's a, a, a cut and paste um, approach, but, but you need to engage around it. And if at any point it is found that a director has been appointed, and we see this very often, I'm sure both Daniel and Asoga and can attest to it, that there are so many people on even high profile boards or, or, or significant companies who just do not have the correct skills and qualifications in place. Um, then the, whoever it is who, who has a problem with it actually has to take it up with the company, not the shareholders. So the company, it, Again, the, the director is appointed by the company. Of course, the shareholders um, will, will pass a resolution at, at shareholders meeting at the AGM, but in terms of, of who you, you take it up with, you, you would need to, your first port of call would be the company and as to why. Um, now, I just want to also practically say that when we talk about board composition from a governance perspective and we talk about a board that is balanced and diverse etc because of we want to encourage um, different opinions perspectives views etc you need to understand that just because you're a chartered accountant or, or a lawyer or have some fancy phd title etc doesn't necessarily mean that if you don't have it you can't be a board member and that's really important i sit on another council where um, one of the most um vocal and and um really wonderfully effective board members is somebody who has all this community grassroots experience um, and understands fully what is expected of her. Um, so we must also be careful of how we pitch 
the, the qualifications and, and what the selection criteria is. So we also don't um, end up as an unintended consequence to institutionalize some of the barriers that we're trying so hard to get rid of. Thank you. Thanks, Faye. Um, I, I know we're, we're running out of time and I do want to close out the session just to allow each of our speakers an opportunity to also just close out some final thoughts. Um, Faye, Daniel and Asobrin, do you have a little bit more time to maybe just answer two more questions? Okay. Um, just because there's just so many questions here and I'm just trying to see if we can at least get an answer to some of the general ones that have been asked for. Um, the one was for Daniel, um, and it says, you know, from, from your presentation, does it imply that where a director has more experience, skills, and qualifications for the position, that the penalty in cases of misconduct would be more severe? Um, I think the short answer is no. As a general proposition, the um, the penalty won't be more severe, um, but the case the, the court uh, will take into account uh, the personal qualifications and experience um, of a particular director in determining the standard of conduct that is expected of them. So, as a general proposition, particularly uh, in in the context of uh, delinquency applications and 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 other proceedings to hold a director liable, uh, in also in determining um, the nature of a particular director's fiduciary duties, uh, the, the court will apply both an objective and a subjective standard. They, they will, on the one hand, ask themselves um, what can reasonably be uh, expected of a reasonable director in the circumstances of this particular matter. Uh, but on the other hand, we'll also more subjectively approach the matter with reference to the actual experience and, and expertise of the particular director concerned. And, and so, and, and we'll expect more um, of, of somebody uh, with extensive experience and, and expertise than they might of somebody who's a novice uh, director. Uh, so in a sense, um, the, the fact that somebody is particularly experienced or has a great deal of expertise um, as a director can be held against them ultimately in determining whether or not they should be held liable. Um, but I'm not sure that that will necessarily translate into, for example, a higher award of damages against them, but, but, but certainly they would be expected to adhere um, to a higher standard um, of, of conduct than might be expected of somebody uh, with comparatively less experience or expertise. Thanks, Daniel. If, you, and then, if I can add to that, um, uh, one of the, the matters that Daniel and I were involved in last year, um, and then the more recent um, Mieni matter, I suppose, is where people um, put themselves out as being corporate governance specialists or professional directors or experienced directors, and they, that's how they introduce themselves. And obviously that creates a, an impression and certainly we've seen that the court has talked about this in, in different instances where they've pinpointed, but if you position yourself as being so experienced and a professional director, then surely you must accept them to be held to a higher standard. So maybe that's just a, a, a cautionary to people out there who are becoming professional directors. Thanks, Faye. I think that's a good point to make. Um, the second last uh, question is, since we talked about public sectors, I thought it's only fair uh, for our audiences that comes from the nonprofit uh, uh, space because they've, they've asked some questions around, you know, do the same governance standards, you know, apply to them as it would listed companies and SOEs? And I think the answer there is quite simply yes. Um, and, and Faye and, and Daniel can maybe add a bit more comments to that. And then it, there was around a question of what rights do the beneficiaries of nonprofits have? So do they, like shareholders, um, have grounds to institute legal actions against uh, the trustees of a nonprofit, for example? Um, okay, I'll go first. Um, the question, you're quite right, in the most simplest general um, uh, form, yes, all directors are created equal, irrespective, again, of what 
type of entity and and we're not just saying directors it's also leaders of of um governing bodies so you must include ratepayers associations here um, school boards etc when you're in this position of leadership obviously if you are appointed a director and registered on SIPSI, um you know they they very definitive legal um uh, a legal framework that that applies for for a non-profit organization though as much as the the same standards are expected again um, it does talk to, like Daniel alluded to, the reasonable director test in that instance as to what could be expected of you. Um, if you are an NPC, um, especially now with COVID and you are running a, a shelter or a soup kitchen, um, what could be, ex what standard is expected of you? And there, I think I would default to common law as well and looking at your fiduciary duty so that you can understand practically what is expected of you. Because sometimes if you have a smaller entity that's more a community-based entity, the Companies Act and the PFMA seems really far away and quite, you, you know, challenging. Um, so just to understand the basics would be then the, the common law duties, your fiduciary duties, duty of care skill, etc. And unfortunately, well, just the, the reality of it is if you are getting any money from any public um, uh, channel, then you will be held accountable and measured against the law, um, the, the PFMA. So even if you are operating in a community space, if you're getting money from uh, social development or National Lotteries Commission, etc., you need to be mindful that you will be measured in terms of the PFMA. Um, other than that, the Companies Act would apply quite simply. I see Daniel is nodding his head. Is it okay? Um, and then the last question, which I've I've sorry. left for last. Sorry, we didn't, we didn't answer Daniel. We didn't answer the the question of the beneficiary. So the beneficiaries are stakeholders in the ecosystem, and like shareholders, um, they definitely have a say. But I just want to caution you in the NPC space because. Um, there's, there are degrees in terms of, of rights and responsibilities in the NPC space, which differ slightly. And um, it depends who the beneficiaries are, if they have been clearly identified. You want to go to your founding documentation here and, and assess then what the, the relationships are in terms of rights and responsibilities on both sides as to, again, um, locus and, and who can apply. Um, uh, and you know, for a claim, who can lodge a claim, etc. That's important. So it can't just be some person far away who, like you know, a soup kitchen, for example. If you're a beneficiary in terms of being fed, and you're not being fed one day, it's going to be very difficult for you to to lodge a claim based on locus and again the relationship between you and the NPC. So I just think that uh, um, that's that's a very broad question. So you need to assess. Thanks, Faye. Um, thanks for picking that up. So the, the last one, and, and I think you've covered this, but I think it's just important to actually ask this one again to just bring it home. And I think it, it, it summarizes um, our, our session for today. And that was, there is often the misconception that non-executive directors somehow enjoy some protection or more protection versus executive directors since they're not involved in the day-to-day -day running of the business comments. So I thought that was a nice one just to round off the, the Q&A. Um, Faye, Daniel, so good. anyone wants to answer that one? Um, I've spoken quite a lot. I don't know if the guys want to, to jump in. Um, but... I made the point that all directors are created equal and a director relationship is very different to an employment relationship. When you're an executive director, it means you have two relationships with the company, that of being an employee and that of being a director. And yes, when you are an ex officio director, as the CEO, for example, would be you are appointed to the board by virtue of the fact that you are a CEO. And yes, you are um, more able to understand and appreciate the dynamics and the nuances because you're involved in the daily management and control of the company. But certainly it doesn't mean that you have any more or less liability than a non-executive director. Um, 
it just, you know, the, again, the reasonable director test would apply and a reasonable director in, in that circumstance. So obviously as a CEO or an executive director, you might become more familiar with potential fraud or wrongdoing or malfeasance prior or in between board members. But if it is significant enough and if the, the consequences are serious, then I would also expect that the management team is in um, uh, constant communication with the board via the chairperson in between board members. So it's really the measure is also if you look at why what a board does, a board sets um, strategic direction, monitors and takes time as corrective action. Where the measure in terms of liability comes in is have you taken time is corrective action once you discovered what was going on. And that is how practically you will be assessed and not found wanting. So again, the, the, the um, operational distinctions have somehow um, created an impression that some people will be more liable than another. And, and I think Daniel put it very nicely earlier on that the penalty doesn't change. The penalty is the penalty. What might change, of course, is the degree of liability in terms of quantum um, and damages as to, to um, where you might find yourself positioned. Thank you, Faye. Um, I'm going to end off or close, try and close off our session now. So um, I'm just going to give each one of you just a, a few minutes if there's any parting remarks or anything that you'd like to just leave our listeners this morning. So I'll start off with you, maybe a Sogren. Okay, I think at the end of the day, you know, a person needs to, uh, needs to know and understand what they are getting themselves into when they become a director. They need to do the basics right, and they need to read. I think Faye made a very interesting point. You know, I think in this age of instant gratification, people do not want to read. I think if you read, and uh, you know, you save yourself a lot of uh, you know pain and heartache down the road. Um, and I think, you know, when you become a director, it is very important that you act in the best interests of the company. Uh, thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Asobrin. Faye, since you're directly following Asobrin. Um, thanks, Vicky. First of all, I want to say um, thank you for hosting the session. Um, I think that we need to have more of these types of sessions where we, we um, not just share information that people are unaware of because they don't read, but also as to the practical implications of it. I'm also a bit honored to be um, uh, on a panel with both these gentlemen who obviously, again, we, we, we at the coal face in terms of seeing what the, the realities and the implications are of, of people not fulfilling their duties. I just want to, to say to, to anyone, whether you're accepting a directorship and also in this a time that we're in with the economic um, pressures that we're all facing, where we are encouraging um, smaller businesses, um, you know, to, or, or people to become more active in the, the medium business spaces. The minute that you register a company and you become a director, don't assume that that's now your little private show. You actually do have some responsibilities. And so I really want to urge people to, before they take it up, like a server and says, understand what it is that you are required to do, understand what is expected of you. And then for existing directors, whether in the listed or the unlisted space, public or private or NPC, do your jobs. I, I keep saying, do what you were appointed to do and all will be well. Thank you. Thanks, Faye. Daniel? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I th uh, thank you also for um, arranging this session. I think it's been uh, interesting and informative. Um, I think just to add in conclusion, um, I think somebody who's approached to, uh, with a view to becoming a director uh, should ask themselves the question if they attempted to accept uh, the, the nomination and the appointment as to why they want to serve on the board of that particular entity. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it's natural, it's human nature uh, for many of us to, to feel flattered by the fact that we might be invited to serve on a particular board structure. Um, but, but really, ultimately, it's, it's not about the prestige and the glory and so on of serving uh, on, on a board. If, if that's your motivation, then you should decline. Um, really, 
ultimately, I think one needs to understand that very often uh, serving on a board structure is a thankless task. Um, if, if it's done properly, uh, it involves a, a great deal um, of work. Um, and um, very often you're not going to be thanked for what you are doing. Um, and you've got to be prepared to assume that responsibility because ultimately that's what it is. You, you, you're taking responsibility and it's a responsibility to act in the best interests of other people. Uh, ultimately, that, that's what you're doing as a director. Uh, and if you're not prepared to assume that responsibility and, and, and assume it in its totality, um, then one should decline uh, the invitation to, to take up a board appointment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sir, uh, Daniel, Sergeant, and Faye for joining us this morning. I was taking a few notes while each of you were speaking and throughout the session. And I think you all have pretty much touched on the, on the key pointers that I picked up from what you have relayed. Um, the only two extra things that I could potentially add to what you've said is, is to companies to ensure that they have the correct people on the board and, and they've got the correct experience to you know, ensure from a both subjective and objective perspective that you, you have the right people there. And you know, I'm gonna end with what I think all three of our panelists have mentioned throughout the session, that all directors are equal in terms of their role and responsibilities. So they have the same standard of care, irrespective of your classification or, or category as a director. So I think that is probably the key point to take away from, from this session. Um, and just to conclude with a few things is uh, I think Faye did mention, might have mentioned this during her session that we do actually have a new program which, which Faye is actually will be facilitating around director diligence and versus delinquency. And we're using the Mieni judgment as a practical uh, case study to showcase um, you know, your director's diligence and how you need to look at your actual fiduciary duties and responsibilities. So I think it's gonna be a very interesting uh, program and the dates um, are listed there in terms of the upcoming session. So if you are interested, you're welcome to go onto the ID website and take a look at that program and book if you wanna delve much more deeper than what I think we've covered in this session. Um, and lastly, is a thank you from myself and the rest of the IDCA team for our panelists joining us today. It was wonderful to have all of you on, online and be able to actually share. Um, well, we interact, I interact with all three of you. So it was great to have our members and the public also get to interact with you as well. And thank you all for, for all that you do, I think, in this space as well, in your individual rights. I think you do make a difference and you assist the public um, and ensure that this profession of directorship is actually upheld and not taken lightly. So thank you to the three of you. Um, I look forward to seeing you again and hopefully we will have more sessions like these in the future. So thank you everybody. Uh, we will see you all again next week, Wednesday, same time, same place. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you.